Hey everybody, what's happening? Neil back once again with another streaming review for you. And this time I'll be taking a look at the new Masters of the Universe Revelation. So this is a show on Netflix. A lot of exciting action sequences, a decent animation design, and an A-list cast will certainly impress. But will the story please longtime fanboys? That's, that's going to be the tough part. Yes, well, this is just part one, apparently, these, uh, this first five episodes that were developed by Kevin Smith, who also wrote episode one. And uh, I'm only going to talk about that episode in detail. So I am going to talk about episode one and what happens there, what really kicks off the main plot of these five episodes. But there won't be any other spoilers past episode one. So if you want to know zero, <laughs> go watch the show, come back. And yeah, there you go. So it's produced by Powerhouse Animation, actually, uh, Powerhouse Animation Studios. It has a, an amazing cast, you know, with a few very familiar voices couple of actors from Game of Thrones and a who's who of Hollywood voice actors, really. Uh, Chris Wood does a good job here as the dual lead, playing both Prince Adam and his alter ego, He-Man. It's a different kind of He-Man uh, in terms of uh, d design with the Adam compared to He-Man. Adam seems smaller and younger uh, than He-Man, unlike the old cartoon where you know they both looked exactly the same with the exception of a change of clothes, and a tan, <laughs> and a lower voice, right? Uh, He-Man had a lot more bass in his voice, and Prince Adam, he just kind of, he kind of sounded kind of like a soft guy like that, you know? <laughs> but I actually like Chris Wood's uh, voice here, it's, it's pretty cool. Steven Root also stands out here as Cringer. Now, Alan Oppenheimer was the original voice of Cringer, uh, Skeletor and many others, and he plays Moss Man here in a smaller role, while Mark Hamill takes on the iconic role of the man with no face, Skeletor. You, you know, his Skeletor is pretty close to his famous Joker voice, or perhaps it's a bit more like his Hobgoblin voice on the 90s Spider-Man series. I think it's closer to that one, but it's very, very recognizable. In either case, Hamill does a good job. Stephen Root, you've seen him on Barry, you've heard him on uh, King of the Hill and other things. He does an amazing cringer. I really like his cringer. So, you know, the actors were really well chosen here for their parts. Uh, the story, however, you know, it starts with this attack, this trick attack by Skeletor. Uh, the end result actually sees He-Man and Skeletor apparently killed and thus, the middle of this five-part series uh, winds up being focused more on Tila, who's voiced by Sarah Michelle Gellar, Buffy herself, and Evil Lynn as well has a large role here in uh, in the bulk of this uh, five-part series, uh, voiced by Lena Headey, and she's a very seductive voice. We all know Lena Headey as Cersei Lannister from Game of Thrones, and she was Sarah Connor, she's done so many great roles. The story takes a rather bold direction, though, by having He-Man's identity revealed once, you know, to everyone, not just a few people, once it's thought that he's dead. So this decision, this revelation, that actually comes with uh, some dire consequences for several characters, including Tila and Man-at-Arms, who's uh, really, really awesome. He's played by Liam Cunningham. Uh, Sir Davos from Game of Thrones. Uh, so in terms of some of the other smaller side characters, I'm not so crazy about them. You know, the uh, Andra character, she's this ally of Tila. When Tila winds up going her own way, it's her and Andra taking on the world, I guess, you know, trying to, you know, bring things back to uh, the kind of the paradise that it, that it once was, I guess, uh, looking for answers and looking to defeat their enemies. Still... Uh, but, you know, the thing about Andra, or Andra, you know, she's just kind of annoying. She's, she's, you know, <laughs> and here I thought that was Orko's job, was to be annoying. Uh, Orko here is actually not so annoying. He's actually kind of cool, kind of interesting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Andra, she seems a bit strange, like the dialogue. Some of it seems like very earthy, very California, you know, Valley Girl kind of, kind of dialogue. It's kind of strange. Um. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's what they're going with here, and that's, I guess that's Kevin Smith, you know, writing that kind of dialogue that kind of takes you out of the fantasy a little bit, unless unless she's from Earth and they explain that. But anyway, I mean, you know, this is a kind of a cheesy show with some cheesy lines, naturally. I mean, we are talking about a property originally created to sell toys, and uh, I don't even think the original creators of He-Man thought it would be this big, you know, even today, in 2021. 
Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, the series also doesn't really seem to be aimed specifically at kids. You know, it seems a lot more aimed at adults. I mean, when Evil Lynn says, you know, bollocks, <laughs> you know, you get the sense that this wasn't really made for kids uh, at all. Uh, I think it's fairly watchable, but, you know, for kids to watch, it's not too scary, not too, you know, adult, but um, but it, it really seems like it was aimed at, a, at a, you know, <laughs> more like my generation, more people that have been He-Man fans since they were little kids. Uh, but there is a uh, you know a slight nod here too uh, to the live action Masters of the Universe with Dolph Lundgren and Frank Langella. So there's a little little nod there, a little wink to the audience there in in, in one scene. So look out for that. The uh, colorful and well performed characters. Uh, you know, are, are what really stand out here. Uh, like I said, the performances are fantastic. Uh, well, there's some early reports about the show being all about Tila, you know, a little too woke because it's all about, you know, females, you know, strong female characters. Nah, it, it's not It's not so much that, you know, it really doesn't focus on that kind of uh, an agenda or anything. I mean, Tila is indeed a really big, important part of this middle of this five episode story arc. I mean, she's you know, she really winds up being the main character because with He-Man, he does get kind of stale after a while. He's really just, you know, okay, so he's kind of like Superman. He's got this, you know, alter ego. He's super strong. Nobody can stop him. He doesn't really seem to have a weakness, unlike Superman, where Kryptonite was his weakness, you know, in magic. In this case, it, it might just be magic. That might be He-Man's only weakness uh, and his friends, you know, maybe, you know, being held hostage and things like that. Like, that's that's the only way to get to a guy like, like He-Man. So he's not that interesting. Tila is a little bit more interesting in that sense in terms of her vulnerability, what she's been through, you know, she's been lied to. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of the He-Man fans, you know, they should be happy with the amount of classic characters that we do get here. We get Orko, we get Trapjaw, and Triclops, and Merman, and Roboto, and, you know, Faker, and just so many of these really interesting um, side characters that, you know, bring back good memories like Beast Man and whatnot, you know. Uh, so, hey, there's more than enough characters in these five episodes alone to please uh, fans that were hoping to see one of their favorites pop up, and I'm sure there'll be more in part two. But even the most cynical He-Man fans, you know, they really should give it a try. Uh, it might just warm their nostalgic hearts at times, honestly. Uh, it is goofy. I'm not going to say it's perfect by any stretch. There is some silly, goofy, kind of He-Man-esque stuff that goes in there. So I guess that's kind of appropriate. But that's one of the things that I always thought was made He-Man not really one of my favorite things, in, you know, compared to G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Star Wars and things. He-Man was kind of lower on the ladder for me because it was kind of goofy. It was kind of silly. It was over the top. Everybody was on steroids, you know. It, <laughs> the guy gets electrocuted. He gets a tan and now he's got superpowers, you know, it's kind of like, uh, okay. So, but, you know what, all things considered, this was a pretty successful continuation of that original, beloved 80s TV show, and, uh, you know, the, the fantastic, huge action figure line that we all remember. Um, so the show, you know, the, the action sequences are very well done, the animation is very fluid, and it really does generate the kind of kinetic energy that a show like this requires to be memorable. So each episode is about 25 minutes or so, approximately, and, uh, you know, that's nothing. You can eat those up in no time. So, uh, I breezed right through it, I binged watched all five episodes... You know, wasn't looking at my phone, it wasn't boring, not for long anyway, so I think it was pretty good, and I do recommend it. I'm going to give Masters of the Universe Revelation a 7.5 out of 10. That's all for me, guys. Until next time, peace. <laughs>